Welcome to the Starting Over Stronger Show, where you'll find help and hope for your divorce survival and recovery. Divorce well, live well. And that's my goal, whether you're married, divorced, whatever it is, to be able to live the life that you envision and not be saddled with debt or assets that are creating more stress than they are enjoyment. Hey guys, welcome back to Starting Over Stronger, Divorce Survival and Recovery. Today is going to be another great conversation on the subject of money. One of the few topics that we will come at from many different angles with many different experts because it's just that important. Joining me today is Melissa Ellis. Melissa is a certified financial planner and certified divorce financial analyst. She specializes in assisting through the complex financial issues of divorce. Melissa and I met through a local networking group a couple years ago, and I had just shared with another gal about my divorce real estate and coaching services, and her eyes and ears immediately perked up, and she took me across the room saying she had someone I had to meet, and that someone was Melissa, who, as I recall, had been looking to connect with an RCSD realtor, and she and I have been collaborating ever since. It is always a pleasure to sit down with you, Melissa, to discuss how we can help people going through divorce in ways that many people facing divorce struggle without. So, hello again, and welcome. Hi. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. It's always a pleasure to sit down with you, Melissa, to discuss how we can help people going through divorce in ways that many of the people going through divorce have to struggle through without. If you would, take just a few minutes and talk about yourself, introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about your own personal divorce situations and experiences, and let us know a little bit about who you are. Yeah, whenever I first got married, I was 20 the first go around, and I never thought I would ever be divorced once in my life, much less twice. Yeah, the first marriage was very long, produced three fantastic kids out of that. That was one thing that we did great together, <laughs> raised great kids. And um, so I, I don't regret any of those years because that was the right thing at that point in time. After the kids grew up, as I see now with a lot of my current clients, kids go to college and, you know, that's really the next thing is, oh, split up. There's really nothing left. We did what we stayed together for. And so I was single for a little while and then randomly met someone when I was at a Royals game and great guy. And I really I gave him my business card because I thought maybe he would be a client. As it turns out, we became friends. We were friends for quite a while because I really wasn't interested in dating at that point in time. Long story short, we dated and then we got married. And it was probably about uh, three or four years after we first met. And so we were married for quite a while, and then he just really didn't want to be married. <laughs> I think we still talk. We still get along, and I get along with both of my ex-husbands, so that's a good thing. I think that's it's really important, especially when you have a family. Um, and so my first ex-husband, we can be at grandkids' birthday parties and our kids' celebrations, and everyone's great. Yeah, my second ex-husband moved to Colorado, so <laughs> I don't really see him very much, but yeah. but we still chat here and there. Well, that's good. Thank you for sharing. I appreciate that. I think it just helps listeners to, to have a little bit of a perspective of where you're coming from. And so, again, as I know you guys are facing the possibility of divorce or trying to survive one, you definitely have questions, probably a zillion questions for your attorney really for anybody who will listen, right? About money, income, expenses, alimony, child support, retirement, home equity, investments, insurance, and so much more. So today, Melissa and I are going to do our best to help you sort through some of the most important first steps, the major things that you need to deal with assessing and protecting your financial resources during the process of severing your marital income, assets, and debts. And of course, there's always a lot to cover, so we'll just get started. <laughs> so I asked Melissa to kind of give me a list of what are the big things that we really need to think about in the beginning. And the first thing that she said was to be certain that you want to get divorced. That seems kind of like a no-brainer, right? But it, there's something there, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, it does seem like a no-brainer, but I often get a phone call from somebody who says, I'm thinking about getting a divorce. Usually it's a woman. Men don't usually think through this and think <laughs> that they need to figure out the financial. They should, but they just don't. That's just not their nature, I guess. But mostly it's women that think about it. Either they think that they're going to get a divorce, that maybe it's on the horizon 
maybe their spouse is acting differently, or they're thinking about, "Eh, maybe I want to get a divorce, but they want to know that financially they'll be okay. And that's usually their first question to me. And they haven't spoken to anyone else yet for the majority of the time. They haven't spoken to an attorney. They probably haven't even told their friends and they haven't told their spouse yet. Yeah. And so that's the first thing is make sure you really want to get divorced because once you have that conversation or bring it up, you have changed that relationship forever. So if it's, and usually my first question, somebody when they call is, have you seen a counselor? And because if there's a way to save them, I would much rather have people be a financial planning client than a divorce planning client. So that's the very first thing is just make sure you really want to before you go down that path. Well, and so that's the best way to figure it out then is to get in with a counselor and just really explore those feelings and, and the situation at hand. So number two then is to speak to a certified divorce financial analyst. And there you go. And that would be me. <laughs> <laughs> you just happen to know one, right? I happen to know one. Yeah, I, I know a few. And um, and that's really kind of, I say I know a few because if I get to capacity or if it's a case that I feel like it's not a good fit for me, I have someone else to refer them to. So, and I'm happy to do that. If it's not a good fit for either one of us, there's always another solution. But the importance of that is kind of goes back to the very beginning we were talking about Make sure that, you know, financially you have everything in line and find out what it is that you need to do sometimes before you have that conversation, because as we'll go on, we'll talk about gathering documents, which would be the next thing on the list. But once you have that conversation with your spouse about getting a divorce, you might not have access. It might be determined in that conversation that one of you is going to leave the house that you share. Then you might not have access to financial documents and things that would be very helpful to have. So I think talking to that certified divorce financial analyst, finding out what your options are, not just about what documents to gather, but ways to get divorced and who who else should they talk with? Do you need a referral to another professional? Because you really need a team yeah. um, whenever you get divorced. It's not just an attorney, not just a certified divorce financial analyst, not just a counselor, but all of those working together with you. So uh, t- talk a little bit more about what a CDFA is, what kind of training you have, what you actually do when you're working with a client that's different than who they might call otherwise? Right. So a certified divorce financial analyst has gone through, uh, they have to have three years of experience. They have to have a at least a bachelor's degree. It doesn't have to be in a, a particular field, but they do have to have a bachelor's degree. Then there is a study program that they go through that can take Well, it depends on how long, but usually a year or less. Go through that study program specific to divorce financial topics, tax being one, and that's really a big area of it, is probably there were more questions about taxes than anything else because it is a very complicated area and that is different than when you're doing regular tax planning. And then you have to take uh, a series of exams, pass those, and then uh, you become a certified divorce financial analyst. And then you have to continue with education, about 15 hours of continuing education per year to keep that certification. And what is it that you would do that that if, I I don't know who else a person might call if they're thinking, how do I get my ducks in a row? Who else would they call? Maybe their their regular financial planner? Yeah. So, well, let's kind of go back to that because I was a certified financial planner long before I became a certified divorce financial analyst. Mm -hmm. And I did actually work with a couple of cases as a certified financial planner, which takes about the same amount of uh, effort. Actually, it's, it's a harder certification to get and to maintain. Mm-hmm. So I thought, all right, I know a lot about financial planning. I also have a master's in personal financial planning, so I felt like I'm pretty well equipped. But as I got into uh, a more complicated case, I'm like, all right, nope, there's a lot more here to learn. So then I learned about the Certified Divorce Financial Analyst designation, which is there aren't a lot of us out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, when we go to our annual conference, there's only, you know, two to 300 people there. Wow. And that's almost everybody. Nationwide. <laughs> so, nationwide. Wow. It's not, there aren't very many. And there aren't very many of us here in Kansas City. That was, you know, the that first inkling that, okay, there's more to learn. Well, then after I got the certification, I realized there's even more to learn. And so I've, I've done some um, more training with other experienced certified divorce financial analysts Mm -hmm. just to go over all the different possibilities of, you know, to make sure that we have everything covered. So there's a lot to know. So a regular financial 
advisor is not going to have that background. And it's more than just adding up your assets and liabilities and dividing by two. Yeah. Um, there's so much more to know about it. And there are special nuances in taxes that as a certified financial planner, I didn't know existed in the divorce world. Yeah. So that's where it's great to keep your financial advisor on your team for your wealth management because your certified divorce financial analyst will not do your wealth management. They won't you know, take care of your portfolio. That would be a conflict of interest, mm-hmm. in fact. And especially there are times when I act as a financial neutral and work with a couple as a certified divorce financial analyst. I'm also a mediator, so I have you know, that background as well. Mm -hmm. But if I'm working with a couple to help them figure out the financial piece of their divorce, then it would be a huge conflict of interest to manage either one of their portfolios. Um, So that's where you still want to keep your regular financial advisor on your team and ideally have them work with your certified divorce financial analyst as well. I get quite a few referrals from other financial planners that are like, all right, it's divorce. I'm going to have you help my client with that. And then at the end of the divorce process, they stay with that financial planner. So not with me. As you're talking about this, I'm thinking, is there a particular kind of person that it would benefit from your services the most? And and what I'm wondering is, do you have a broad audience as far as like, do they need to have a huge estate and high assets to, to really benefit from working with you? Or could anyone, even if they're, you know, they have more debt than assets, yeah. benefit as well? Well, there you go. It, especially if they have more debt <laughs> they have assets, they probably need some kind of a creative settlement. And that's where a certified divorce financial analyst can help with a creative settlement that perhaps an attorney might not think about. I actually had an attorney say to me, you know, I went to law school to learn about law and handle that part of it. I also went to law school, so I wouldn't have to do math and finance. And so that is not their expertise. And Mm -hmm. so I can really help in in that arena a lot, uh, simply because they just don't have that background and don't really want to work with that piece as much as working with the law piece of it. A particular client, yeah, it could be as simple as two people, no kids, haven't been married very long. I can help them with that. And actually, we can probably simplify the divorce process and talk about the different ways that they can get divorced because... There are attorneys I've partnered with that once we get the financial piece of it figured out, then um, we partner with that attorney. They prepare the documents and make it a pretty painless process. It doesn't have to be where they each have an attorney to try to work things out. Right. We can work it out. The financial piece of it first Mm -hmm. makes it a whole lot easier. Yeah, for sure. Well, so let's back up to you had mentioned earlier uh, gathering financial documents. This might get missed by a lot of people. Uh, you know, how, what's the best strategy for being sure you have everything you need? So I do have a checklist. Mm-hmm. <laughs> people can contact me and I'll prov- and provide that checklist to them. But um, you want to make sure you have at least three years of your tax returns, three years of all of your credit card statements, bank statements. You want your most recent pay stubs for both of you, if if you have access to that for both spouses, just so that you know what your current financial picture looks like. I've had seen requests from attorneys where they're asking for all of the loan applications for any loans that are open that you think about, you you might have a car loan, it might have gone back five or six years. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, or if it's a personal loan, that could be even 10 years ago that you might have applied for that. So Everything you can possibly think of in your financial life Mm -hmm. is what you need to be able to collect. And to be safe, go back and get three years because if you are each working with an attorney, each spouse is working with an attorney, that's what the attorneys will ask for. If we're working through it with me as a financial neutral, trying to just really work with a mediator or Mm -hmm. with an attorney directly just to get things uh, wrapped up, We probably don't need to go that far back, but just to be safe, I would get all of that documentation. Also, things like a copy of your marriage certificate. You're going to need that later on. Think down the road whenever you apply for Social Security. You'll need a copy of your marriage certificate, a copy of your divorce decree, copies of birth certificates for you, your spouse, and your children. Those are important. Know the important dates, like the date of marriage, You, which if it's a marriage certificate, you'll know it. Mm -hmm. But I've had people, you know, I'm not sure. (laughs) 
Wow. <laughs> Which I think is kind of funny. It surprised yeah. me that people would not just know that date right off. But yeah. your spouse's social security number, that's important. Of course, that'll be on the tax return. They also make a list of all of your assets and go through and think of everything that you have. Maybe not every fork, knife, and spoon in the house, but all the major assets, you know, homes that you own, cars, mm-hmm. If you have toys like boats and jet skis and anything that has a license plate on it, Mm -hmm. think of what all of those are. Um, Whether you intend to, you know, have that asset in the future or not, you want to make sure that you know what all of those things are. If you know what your assets were at the time that you got married, and this is especially important for a second marriage because you probably have both established, you know, financial lives separately, or if you got married later in life, even as first marriage, got late you know, maybe say in your 30s, you got married, you've Mm -hmm. already been working for a while, you've accumulated assets and debts, have copies of whatever you had at the time that you got married, because if it's non-marital, it can be determined non-marital, and you have documentation for that, that will make it a whole lot easier when you're going through that settlement process. Yeah, for sure. Well, you, and you mentioned, you know, the assets and liabilities, So that and that was going to be our next topic. Those can be big things, but they also can be small things. And, and I thought when you were talking, you mentioned you don't have to write down every fork, knife, and spoon. But I, I actually literally went through the whole house with a, a clipboard and just wrote down, looked or, sat in every room and just wrote down everything because my goal was to ask fairly as possible, divide up what was in that room, get what was really important to me, but you leave things that would be really important to him and make right. sure that it wasn't heavily one way or the other, you know, in every room of the house. So yeah. that may be something you want to do. <laughs> yeah, no, and that that's a great idea. I actually went through and videotaped every, every closet, opened mm-hmm. every closet, just took video of what was in there and yeah. went to every cabinet, every drawer, opened it up. And that way I had a visual record as well. I think I did that too. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think that's a great idea just so that you can talk, especially if you're going to be the spouse that's leaving that house or if you're getting ready just to pack everything up and because you think you're going to sell that house, which Mm -hmm. we'll talk about that later. But yeah, yeah, if everything goes into a box, it's hard to remember what was in in that box or what used to be in that cabinet. So yeah, I think... Especially if you're not there anymore. Exactly. And it's, it's harder to go through. You think you live in a house forever mm-hmm. and you know where what you have and where it is but you go back and think of it today try yeah. to go through one room in your house and write down everything in it and then go home and see what did you miss yeah 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 it's like that game we used to play it is it's like a memory <laughs> game <In> the magazine <laughs> <laughs> can make divorce fun with a game like that <laughs> yeah we didn't know we were practicing for divorce <laughs> no seriously so to determine your goals for custody Thinking about the kids, yeah. what, what we got to do about that, what's fair, what's reasonable. Right. Have in mind what it is that you would like, because mm-hmm. that is going to be a difficult conversation. And you don't want to go into that conversation not knowing what it is that you want. Is it really important to you to celebrate Christmas on Christmas Eve or Christmas Day? Is there some tradition in your family that you've observed or in your spouse's family, you know, think about that, you know, all right, how just think through it, how that's going to work. But also what is the day to day care for those children look like? Mm-hmm. You know, are you going to live in the same school district so that makes it easy for the kids is you know, there are a myriad of ways that you can have custody. And that's more of a topic with your attorney. But it's one of those, I think you just need to think about it ahead of time. And when you have that conversation, it'll be a whole lot easier. Yeah. For sure. And and I think all of these things would be great to journal, just just to write through all of these topics and think really deeply about, you know, wh- why you want to get divorced, you know, so that you can really make sure you want to. And who do you need to talk to? And what do you need to gather? And, you know, what do we have? What do we own? What do we owe? You know, and all of those things, I think we are so busy nowadays that it's like when somebody tells me to think about something, I, I literally always have the thought, when am I going to do that? <laughs> yeah. When do I have time to think? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And that's another thing. You know, take care of yourself through this whole yeah. process because yeah, it is very stressful. Yeah. And uh, but I love your idea of journaling because if you can get it out onto paper, mm-hmm. and I know somebody who said he journals every day and then he takes it and he wads it up and throws it away. Yeah. And I thought that was funny. And then he had switched to a format where it was in a bound book. Mm-hmm. He was like, all right, I'm not going to tear a page out every day. But when he got to the end, it was full. 
he thought, well, I might go back and look through. Well, then after he did that, he was like, uh, you know what? I really don't want to relive Revisit all of that. Yeah. So he took it and he burned it. And, you know, he <laughs> it, he says very um, cathartic <laughs> just yeah. to be able to do that. Yeah. So I thought that was a great idea. But I love the idea of just journaling and getting it all out. Mm-hmm. But it also helps you come up with creative ways to maybe figure out how you're going to you know, share time with the children or how you're each going to go forward and celebrate their birthdays and holidays um, because I think that's that's important. Yeah. Yeah, I've always thought journaling was really, truly the most important thing that I could do when I, especially during a time of struggle because I often don't know what I'm thinking until I actually sit down and write it, you know, and, and especially with stuff as heavy as this that, you know, you can think in your head all day about all this stuff and come to no conclusions, but when you sit down and write, that's when you really start putting things together and can really start... I think making decisions that you would have a good feeling about, you know, that you really feel like you've assessed well. The last thing that you had written here was to figure out your living situation, who's keeping the house, and, you know, and maybe sometimes that's not an issue if they're renting. But if it is, how do we handle that? Well, even if you're renting, sometimes it's like, well, one of you stay in that place. Yeah. You know, and sometimes people want a whole new fresh start, and mm-hmm. they're both going to go away and rent a new place. Or... Like you said, if you own a house, you know, you're not going to own it together, you know, yeah. continuously, you know, decide, are you going to sell it before you get divorced, mm-hmm. you're going to sell it after you get divorced? You could do either, probably cleaner to sell it before. Mm-hmm. But also the big question is, should you keep the house or should either of you keep it? Can you afford the house? Yeah. And that's something that that's usually the number one question, usually more from women than men. They'll ask, you know, can I keep the house? Mm-hmm. Then we talk through, you know. Well, should you keep it? Do you really want to keep it? Emotionally, how does that make you feel? Yeah. And then we figure out the financial piece of that. Can you afford it? And if it doesn't make financial sense or it's going to strain your budget Mm -hmm. down the road, you know, that's just, you're just creating more stress and problems down the road. So if you can get that into your head early on, what's going to happen? Where are you going to live? And if you can imagine, you know, not living in the house that you're in. And a lot of times that's my question is, if you didn't live in this house or this house didn't exist, where would you live in the Mm -hmm. future? And they can visualize that and think about, okay, well, it'd be nice if I could live in this part of town and this type of an environment. Maybe it's an apartment. Maybe it's a house. Whatever it is, you start visualizing that. And then we can make that as a financial goal and figure out how do we make that happen Mm -hmm. and get the wheels into motion to make that happen as opposed to... Being having that struggle, and sometimes you know something called divorce brain sets in. And mm-hmm. I had a client last year, and I asked her, like, "What about the house? What do you want to do?" She goes, "I don't know." And she, everything was, "I don't know. I don't know. I don't know." And so I was able to help her kind of work through that because yeah. she honestly didn't know. So we looked at it financially, and then we talked a lot about it emotionally. And people don't think about talking to. Th- they're a financial person about their emotions, but divorce is full of emotions. And that actually has been part of my training and my background is mm-hmm. to go through and know how to have those types of conversations. It's also how I, do, how I do financial planning, too. It's not just about numbers. It's really more about what is it that you want to do in life? You know, it's yeah. there are only two things you can do with money. You can spend it or you can invest it mm-hmm. or save it. That's the only thing you can do with money. There's mm-hmm. nothing, oh, you could burn it, you know, <laughs> there, you know, things like that. Stuff a mattress with it. You know, those aren't probably advisable, but yeah. the true use for money. And in the end, you know, it's really whether you're going through a divorce or it's just regular life is figuring out what's money is just a tool to mm-hmm. help you live the best life that you can live. Mm-hmm. And that's my goal, whether you're married, divorced, whatever it is, to be able to live the life that you envision and not be saddled with debt or assets that are creating more stress than they are enjoyment. Right. And you said divorce is emotional, but also finances is emotional. You know, it's, I think it's a very emotional topic. I actually interviewed somebody on this subject, a budget coach, and she, that was the point that she was making was like, how very emotional money is. What do you attach to that? What do you, you know? The interesting thing, you're you're right, money is always emotional and different, you know, a lot of people get divorced because of money Mm -hmm. and it's not lack of it sometimes, sometimes it is, but a lot of times it's just their mindset around money and what did you grow up thinking about money? 
What were your feelings about money? Did your family talk about money? I've heard families say, no, we never talked about fam- or about money. We never talked about how much our parents made. It, we weren't supposed to ask that question. And, you know, they just, money was just a taboo subject. Mm-hmm. And then other families, everyone knows exactly how much money the family has and whether it's a lot or a little um, and they and it's a very open topic and it's a positive thing. And they're mm-hmm. taught about how how to use money and what to do with your money from a young age. And then other families never discussed and they grow up and they they really don't know how to work with that. So I've taken quite a few classes on behavioral finance. And it's really interesting to really kind of figure out what someone's money mindset is, because once you can understand that, which that's really helpful to me as a mediator as well when we're going through mm-hmm. all of this in divorce and knowing where each spouse is coming from, from a, a money mindset. Once you understand that and they can help each other understand, OK, this is what's important to each of them. Yeah. And you can help uh, foster that conversation. It's, a, it's really gratifying work <laughs> to be able to yeah. do that. It makes me feel good if I can help people with that. Because I bet most people don't even realize why they behave the way they do with money. No. They don't ever understand that. And you just assume that everyone grew up the way you did, right? Right. You know, yeah. you think your house, um, I think my household, this must be how everyone. Yeah, it's it was. Normal. Yeah, exactly. It's normal. <laughs> normal exactly. Is. <laughs> what, exactly. What's normal? And. But that's really usually a really taboo subject for a lot of families. And it's like, no, we never discussed money. And I remember when my kids were young, my son, I remember it seemed like it was only maybe a week or so apart. One one day he goes, are we rich? And I'm like, why do you say that? And it was kind of just he was just trying to assess in his head. And he was probably about 12 or 13 at the time. Mm -hmm. And he was just trying to determine, you know, what our status was. And I think he was probably comparing to some of his friends and, and I'm like, well, you know, we probably have more money than some people, but compared to other people, no, we're not rich at all. Mm-hmm. And then it was probably maybe a week or two later, and I'm sure I had told him, no, I, I'm not buying that. You know, mm-hmm. I can't afford that, whatever it was. Well, are we poor? <laughs> <laughs> Just trying to understand where like, we're at, Mom. <laughs> well, you know, we have more money than some and less than some. So, yeah. you know, and it was just really, you know, he was always trying to figure it out. And I thought that was really kind of funny because depending on what the conversation was and it was, uh, I should go back and ask him now, you know, what he was, what he really thought, you know, yeah. did he think that we were rich or we were, were we poor? Yeah. Well, that's a good point. I mean, it's, it is something that starts very early and we have a curiosity about it. I, I can't recall that I ever asked my parents about our financial situation. Now, looking back, I think we probably were pretty, not poor, but definitely not, you know, in the high part of middle class. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, you know, it's it's not even something that I remember, like, being on my radar. And I think it's probably good that, you know, families yeah. do talk about these things because it helps kids to be more financially wise as they get out on their own and understanding debt and assets and yeah. Good use of money. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And to know, you know, what is appropriate use of money mm-hmm. and to understand that sometimes delaying uh, a purchase because you're saving for it mm-hmm. is a lot more of a gratifying purchase than if you just somebody lent you the money as a kid mm-hmm. or as an adult used a credit card and then right. you have to pay for it later. Yeah. Sometimes the satisfaction of that purchase goes away pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think it's it's good, you know, to have those conversations with kids mm-hmm. when they're small. And my mom gave me a really good lesson. <laughs> I was in high school and I saw there's a stack of bills on the table and the checkbook was there and she was going to pay the bills, but she was cooking dinner at the time. I don't even know how the conversation started, except for I was sitting at the dining room table where all of this paperwork was. And, and she said, there, go through the bills and you figure out which ones, you know, how we're going to pay the bills. And so she goes, there's a checkbook. It tells you how much money is in the bank account. There are the bills. And I went through and I got really stressed out because I realized the bills that were there were more than what was in the bank account. Mm-hmm. I'm like, oh my gosh, what are we going to, you know, I'm certainly thinking, you know, my parents are you know poor and that, you know, well, what I didn't know was that maybe something was, you might see the full balance, but maybe... You know, like on your mortgage, you didn't have to pay the full, you had to pay the mortgage, not 
just that monthly bill, Mm -hmm. not the full balance. And so, and there were some bills that were like that. And, and so, or the other part of that was, no, there's another paycheck next week and another paycheck Mm -hmm. the next week that between my parents' paychecks, every week money was coming in. You had to look at when the bills were due and just make sure that they were put. And there's plenty of money to pay all the bills in the month. Mm -hmm. It was just that I was just looking at what was in the bank account on that day, not knowing the other piece of that. So, yeah, and I still remember going to a place in Kansas City called Exchange City. I don't know. I know it doesn't exist anymore. I don't know if anybody listening knows what I'm even talking yeah, about. But I know what you're talking about. Do you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. You're right. It doesn't exist anymore. Maybe and they need it. Like, we need to find a way yeah, to. Re- kids need to know how to deal with, like, I remember something about balancing a checkbook. I remember having to figure out, you know, bills and different things that may or may not have been an exchange city, but I remember yeah. that. And I don't think they do that in the schools right now. Um, I have volunteered with Junior Achievement that they um, have you go out into schools mm-hmm. and teach financial literacy and they have programs and really anybody can volunteer for that, but it really comes from financial professionals. It's fantastic. I was actually teaching this course in an alternative high school in KCK last year. And it was really fun because these kids were in an area that their parents really weren't talking to them about money. A lot of them were on their own pretty early on, financially speaking, and Mm -hmm. maybe they were even getting jobs to help the family Mm -hmm. and parents that had two jobs and they weren't learning this at home. They were really hungry for that information. And just to know that, there are people in the world like me, you know, that you can go talk to about money. Mm-hmm. And I thought this is, you know, it just was so foreign to them. But it was really fun teaching them. And they had, you know, great questions. We pretty much abandoned what the regular curriculum was and said, all right, just went down the path. What do you need to know? And it was actually even more basic than what the curriculum was at hand. Yeah. And so it just get started with how do you handle a bank account? Mm-hmm. You know, what's the difference between a debit card and a credit card? And there's a lot out there. Well, we could talk about that forever, yeah. but I think we veered off of the topic. <laughs> we did. We <laughs> financial first did. steps as yeah. you divorce. Yeah. Now we're talking about financial first steps when you're a kid. Yeah. But, you know, that is that is good to know because I think it's important for us to talk about with our kids. And and I, the thing that I really want to f- uh, focus on at this point and, and as we kind of wrap up is just something that you mentioned when you're talking about figuring out your living situation you said, you know, that you really visit with a person about what their goals are and maybe even their their dreams. And I think that's an important thing to consider overall when you think about your financial first steps is just to really realize that there's a solution to every problem. And and when you're going through divorce, all you can see are the problems, but you if you surround yourself with the right people, you will find the solution for each of those. And I think that's where you've got to get focused. There isn't so much, although we all do this, there isn't so much a right or wrong. Like, you know, he's he's wrong and I'm right or I'm right and, he, you know, whatever. You know, there's not, it's not about what's right and what's wrong. It's about finding what works and what your goals are and what your dreams are and finding the solutions that are agreeable for everyone. And so as you think about your financial first steps, We want you to be focused on, as much as you can, on the long term, the solutions. And so that's really, I think, a good place for us to wrap up. So share what your thoughts are on that. No, absolutely. You're right. And it could be that you each have goals that are in the future that, in the end, it makes it real easy to come to a settlement because you can figure out, oh, this aligns with that person's goal, this aligns with that person's goal, Mm -hmm. and help them find that solution so that they're both happy and they both are able to live the life that they want to live. Well, wow. Thank you so much again, Melissa, for being here, for sharing your knowledge and your experience with listeners today. Listeners, I hope these first steps were what you needed to hear today to help you on your divorce journey. You will find ways to connect with Melissa in the episode description if you feel that's your next best step. And you can also text... I'm going to make sure I'm saying this right, 913-735-0797. Correct. 
And that is if you would like to request a getting organized divorce prep worksheet that she mentioned earlier, she can get that to you that way. And as always, reach out to me at Annie at startingoverstronger.com if you need a divorce coach or real estate consultant to help you make fully informed decisions about whether or not to keep the house. Thank you again for tuning in with us each week to talk about what matters to you in and after your divorce. And remember, whatever you're facing in your divorce, there are people and resources prepared and passionate about being a life preserver during your storm. Reach out and grab a hold of one. Join us again next week for more help and hope as you are starting over stronger.